Ja, hallo und guten Abend. Ganz hello herzlich. And uh, good evening. Welcome to our transitional justice discussion, the Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship of the Eastern Germany and the Federal Government Commissioner for the New Federal States welcome you warmly. My name is Tamina Kutschem. I am the editor of uh, chief editor of decoder.org and I am the moderator of the series of the discussions. Until May 2022, we are going to talk about different examples and compare different examples of um, transitional justice processes after dictatorships and tyranny. We have been dealing with Germany so far and we've dealt with the Visegrad states and this evening we are going to speak about the Baltic states. Remembering two dictatorships, the rivalry of dealing with the past in the Baltic states. This is the title of our tonight's discussion. The independence of 1991 meant um, for the Baltic states of regaining um, their interpretation of their own history. How do the Baltic states deal with their history of the 20th century today? This history was characterized by the annexation of the Soviet Union, but also by the German National Socialist occupation during the Second World War. Which discourse is dominating in the culture of remembrance? How can uh, you remember uh, the uh, injustice of the Soviet time without relativizing the injustice during the German occupation? These are just two of the questions we are going to talk about tonight. And we welcome you warmly to participate in our discussion. You can ask questions in the chat or via email in German or English. Um, so we will use this uh, virtual space for a large international debate. I am very glad that I've got three very interesting guests tonight from the Baltic States. I will start with uh, Violetta W. Ute. A warm welcome to Vilnius. Mrs. W. Ute is professor at the Institute of Politi Political Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University. She focuses on the politics of remembrance, national identity and historical trauma. In her current research projects, she is dealing with um, the depicting of uh, war traumas in late modernity and also with the project of Lithuanian Jewish deportees, an untold story. We are very much looking forward to the stories she is going to tell us tonight. A warm welcome to you, Mrs. W. Ute. Thanks for Let me continue. Here. I'm very glad that you are here. Let me continue. Um, let's go to Riga. A warm welcome to Lolita Tomsona. Mrs. Tomsona is the director of the Janis Liebke Memorial in Riga. There, she uses a very innovative and integrated approach of remembrance. She is going to tell us about this approach more tonight, I think. She um, characterizes uh, the culture of remembrance in Latvia in a new way. And uh, she received uh, the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. We are very glad that you are here with us tonight, Mrs. Tomsona, that you are going to tell us about Latvia and the Latvian society. Welcome Thank to you so you. much. And Thank let you. me also, um, takes a little bit more time for the interpretation, but um, yes. And uh, also a warm welcome to Melis Maripo uh, from Tallinn. Melis Maripo is historian and he is the chair of the board of the Estonian Institute of Historical Memory, which is a non-state institution dealing with the history and the consequences of the foreign rule in Estonia. His uh, research concentrates on the contemporary um, history and the past of Estonia during um, the Nazi occupation and the Soviet occupation since 1940. He is also a member of the Estonian delegation of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Welcome to you, Mr. Maripo. Good evening. 
Uh, Mr. Maripo is going to speak German uh, tonight. And the other two, the ladies, are going to speak English. I'm very glad that you are here. Already before this discussion, we asked you to send us statements on the title of our discussion. And I'm going to start with you, Mrs. W. Jutta, because you read, you, you wrote, the Lithuanian experience of the Nazi and Stalinist dictatorships cannot be separated as they overlapped in time and place. Accordingly, the principal controversy over World War II concerns the issue of collaboration and especially the role that certain members of the anti-Soviet resistance played as Nazi collaborators and participants in the Holocaust. Mrs. W. Ute, would you say that there is a rivalry in dealing with the past in Lithuania? I mean, in the sense that uh, dealing with collaboration lags behind the attempts to deal with the Soviet legacy. Well, um, I would say that um, collaboration is in general a very thorny issue in Lithuanian context. Um, in a way, the collaboration with the Nazi occupational regime does lag behind in terms of um, kind of broader reflection and, um, you know, understanding different levels of collaboration. Let me give you an example. For example, um, in the Soviet context, we had truly several waves of very intense discussion about um, what collaboration of, for example, cultural elites was, sculptors, writers, all, you know, other members of cultural intelligentsia. We do not have this kind of discussion regarding the Nazi occupation, the definition, the, the scope of collaboration actually, uh, and the concept of collaboration in this context still needs to be discussed. Now, as far as your question about competition is concerned, I would not generalize that, you know, competition kind of defines the perception of the past, of the entire society. I would say there are certain groups that invest quite a bit into, um, into the competition, which is absolutely not necessary. Um, um, you know, when one is trying to reflect the past. So this particular, uh, these groups, uh, this particular kind of branch uh, within the Lithuanian society would want to see history as being just kind of black and white um, as a story of pure, pure suffering or pure heroism, sometimes without wanting to see the complexities and the continuities and unfortunately the uncomfortable facts but I really hope that this is this is changing. So, an example of the complexity is uh, the book of Futa Vanavite, ours, uh, which has been discussed a lot in the Lithuanian society. She. Uh, dealt with uh, the question of uh, the collaboration of um, resistance fighters uh, against the Soviet regime, uh, particularly with Adolfas Mamanauskas. What would you say? Is the debate in Lithuania, has it become more differentiated since the publication of this book? Does this uh, debate uh, now uh, contain a more complex view and are people able to deal with ambivalences better now? Well, it's, um, it's kind of a short period of time. That particular book was published in 2016. And I really have to say that this is part of the wave of uh, what I would call a perpetrator or collaborator post memory. This is uh, really just one book among several other books. Uh, and that, that wave, which interestingly enough uh, resembles somewhat um, 
what was happening in Germany with the so-called Fata literature, you know, or the 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 generate the second generation memory or the second generation coming to terms with the with the traumatic past of being an offspring of a collaborator uh, or a perpetrator, and then the third generation memory. So um, this started actually in 2015 somewhere else in the Lithuanian emigre community separately. Then uh, Ruta Vanagaite's book really provoked very intense debates, discussions in Lithuanian context. Then now recently there is similar debate taking place about another book published in the States by another woman called Silvia Forte. But this is actually already a phenomena, I would say, this attempt to explore the history of perpetration through this very personal, almost family history. And I think this is something that is quite unsettling for uh, Lithuanian context, because I think we are not used to dealing with history in that kind of very personal way, almost telling kind of an insider story, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly. But this is, in fact, um, yeah, it's it's truly a, a new phenomenon on um, on this you know wave of post memory and and personal coming to terms. Yeah, vielen the Dank. Frau Thompson yeah. hat sich jetzt hier schon. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Thompson. Raised her hand, and I can imagine that this personal approach is something you are dealing with too. Let us continue with this and get deeper into the topic later on. But now I would like to read out your statement first, Mrs. Thompson. Namely, the decisive question about commemoration of World War II is how to create the inclusive memory, memories of national minorities that live in Latvia. It is not a simple task to have a meaningful conversation about so-called unwelcome memories, memories of collaboration and apathy, especially in the society that nurtures a sense of victimhood. Mrs. Thompson, let us continue with uh, Mrs. Sadawiuta said. In how far can this inclusive way of remembrance or this integrated way of remembrance um, include this personal view? Can the personal view play a decisive role? So I'm, uh, I'm waiting till the translation uh, dissipates. Uh, I raised my hand for one reason. I wanted to mention that in Lithuania, a young filmmaker, uh, Jurgis Matulevich, uh, uh, I'm maybe not pronouncing it exactly, made film uh, Isaac, and it's about Kaunas massacre. I just wanted to illustrate that in Lithuania, um, it's one of the bloodiest, and hardest pages of the history of the Holocaust when uh, local people uh, participated in a massacre in Kaunas and a young filmmaker made a film and he, it was shown in the festivals. Uh, so sometimes, um, to segue into to answering the question, sometimes theater uh, and film industry picks up these very powerful stories and deals with, deals with it in a way that kind of fills this gap between the professional historians and how we as a culture, we as a society reflect on those victims and talking about uh, how to make these memories inclusive. We have one of the best examples is exactly the literature and theater one of the famous one was uh, called a play grandfather where three grandfathers who remember the same war second world war from three very different perspectives so it in a way humanizes history it doesn't show latvians only as the victims sometimes as also collaborators and perpetrators and so it, it, it the conversation is more meaningful because uh, from, from 1990s, we're probably going to talk about it, uh, the main, main kind of course of discourse was this victimization, you know, Latvians as a 
those who suffered in genocide, you know, Stalinist deportations. And it's very hard to make this transition into talking about responsibility, involvement. What does it mean to live under uh, authoritarian and, and, and regime? How, what it does to you, like uh, how you participate in it, you know? So, um, so that, that I find interesting. And also on May 9th, as you know, very, very divided memory about the end of the war. We also have to repeat that for Jewish, for Latvian Jews, that was that was the time when they could finally leave their hiding places, and also so those who were rescued, and for uh, many many of the many people who were hiding, Roma people, you know, um, it means that the, there was some resemblance of the freedom, and and we have to kind of understand also that, you know, so it's not only at the beginning of the second Soviet occupation, so commemoration will be very diverse with that day. Mm -hmm. Wenn Sie so betonen, es ist nicht nur der Beginn der zweiten. So you say that it was not only the beginning of the second occupation, so when talk about this competition or rivalry of the Soviet occupation, do you think that it was it is more anchored or plays a bigger part of the uh, memory or in the memory of um, of the people? Or do you think that people do rather deal with a Soviet um, occupation compared to the Nazi occupation? What do you think? Is it more important? The Soviet occupation, because it was in a way forbidden topic from, you know, all the Soviet time pretty much. So... I think we've spent the last 30 years talking about the Soviet occupation and uh, what the, how families were dispersed and, and killed and lost the home home and were not allowed many of them to return or they were killed. So trying to integrate the story for, the, for, for Latvian Jews who were deported in big numbers in 1941, where many of those families, the Stalinist deportations saved their lives. It's a horrifying notion. It doesn't sound right, you know, because for us that's the main main story. Uh, and my family were also my grandfather was deported, and my grandfather's uh, uh, family members, and and some of them came back, and some of them I never saw. But it never, uh, it it kind of makes it even more powerful to realize that those many Jewish families returned from, from those mm -hmm. deportations, while if they stayed here in Latvia, their chance of survival was, was miserable. It's, yeah, it's complicated. It was much easier in the 90s with the narrative that we were, we were only suffering and all these horrible regimes just did, you know, uh, bad things to us. And I remember it as a school kid and, mm -hmm. and I remember how much easier that was understand yeah this is a perfect yeah that's a perfect bridge built to Melis Maripu because he in one of his statements he said that there's always um, this kind of the question which one was the better one or which one was the worst one which dictatorship was better or worse so um mr maripu i think this is a good idea to get away from my script because in one statement you said when two dictatorships are in the focus or focused on then the question is always which one is better or which one has been worse for whom and why so mr maripu um which question should we ask instead when it comes to history so me as historian i think um it is not about judging it whether it was worse or better when it comes to two dictatorships because this quest question is quite um difficult and i think it leads to a how can i say that this is rather a journalist um, question, maybe, I don't know. 
So it's, um, you know, it's like one journalist wants to investigate something spectacular, but I think we cannot measure it or we cannot put that into context. We should not say which one is better or worse. But don't you think that it is a question not only been interested been interesting for um, journalists, but for the general public, because it, it can also be used in order to justify your own guilt or what you've done. I think that people have their own memory. They have their own um, truth, so to speak, and they won't change the situation because people want want to conserve preserve this memory because they know what was better what was worse they do know that for themselves the younger generation for example the young, younger generations well i don't know i'm not sure whether they need to be historians for example in order to make this decision or to make the choice whether it was better or worse because there have been so many or there are so many categories of different um, memories and ways of commemorating and i don't know whether we can let's say measure this or really make this decision so what in your perspective is the task of the historians is it about displaying or showing the facts is this your task yeah i think First and foremost, this is definitely what we have to do because people like talking about historic and historical events. But I think the people don't know the facts. This is a problem, but they don't have to decide anything. So I think it's important that historians um, explore, that they find out the facts that they unveil them so to speak or disclose them and in order to to show them to people and then the question is um, whether it's up to us to make the decision whether it's better or not but this kind of creates or this a precondition is a free discourse of course and free structures when it comes to um science and i've already said it and i've already mentioned it your institute is a non-state non-public institutions so are you free in your research or is there a mixture or is your um is the estonian state getting involved in your research so i have been working in this field for 20 years and during the last 20 years i've never had the feeling that the state is kind of um getting involved in my work telling me or dictating what I have to do and what to think or that I shouldn't deal with um, this or that topic because we had research plans, for example, and even though we do have private um, supporters or we are a private foundation, nevertheless, we are funded or we have been funded by the state. But nevertheless, they didn't make or the state doesn't make any um yeah they don't tell us what to do and i think this is my personal opinion but i think my colleagues are um, the same opinion that we are free in our work that we can do whatever we like so miss davalute what about you what is your judgment or your perspective when it comes to Lithuania, not only the freedom, the liberty of research, but also regarding the question, do you think that the state or to which extent is the state getting involved into this debate, in this political debate? And is it a political debate today? What do you think? Can you hear me well? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think I wanted to uh, remark, um, to make a remark when I was listening to um, um, to Milis, if I may call you by name. Um, I thought that, um, okay, the investigation that is being done by historians is one thing. And talking about Lithuanian context, a lot of good research has been done and a lot more needs to be done still. But I think the transmission of this research in the society, you know, the, in, the, in the high school books and 
raising awareness in society. I think there is something that really needs to be investigated, and I would even say improve there. Historians do great research, but this is not necessarily the case that, that, that will be effectively transmitted. And so coming back once again to your question about 2016 and Ruta Vanagaita's book, I think it was an excellent, excellent example of it. Uh, in 1988, 1998, as part of the measures for transitional justice, the Commission for the Investigation of Nazi and Soviet Crimes has been established in Lithuania as in the other Baltics, you know, in Latvia and, and, and Estonia as well. And a lot of good research has been done. But then all of a sudden in 2016, you know, boom, there is this absolute, um, uh, you know, kind of um, um, explosion of debates. And so that really shows whether, whether there's not enough publicity or what happened to this, to these volumes of research. Why was this not really distributed in society? I do not have answers to all of these questions. I really, this has to, this needs very good and thorough investigation and reflection but I would think that there is there is something to uh, to look into. So, mm -hmm. uh, glauben Sie, dass es vielleicht Do you think that it becomes easier because you talked about um, Germany you gave, and this kind of uh, brother or father literature? And do you think it becomes easier for the younger generations to get into this topic because they haven't experienced these two dictatorships? Do you think it's easier to deal with um, this legacy or this heritage? Do you think it is easier because it's not as emotional, maybe, for the younger generations? Um. That's also a very good question. And uh, in order to be able to answer for sure, one needs to, you know, to, to, to really know um, what's happening in the entire young generation, right? I work with university students, and I can tell for sure that there is a greater interest and willingness to, to look into it, to investigate, to question, to acknowledge. Um, so I definitely noticed that. I don't know whether this is because of the emotional investment investment or because university students tend to be curious and more open to transnational environment to different perspectives and different research you know work of different researchers and so forth whether this is the case um you know all over Lithuania I really cannot tell but uh I do think as I said before um it's very unfortunate when sometimes the past really becomes you know kind of this there, you know, I would say manis manipulative, uh, the object of this rather manipulative politics of memory, so to say, and there is an intentional effort to antagonize um, experiences and, and narratives to essentialize and really try to kind of solid solidify groups and mobilize groups around that. I think that's a very harmful practice. Hopefully, and this is my, my hope that this is happening on the margins and not, uh, but as far as the mainstream is concerned, I do see progress. It definitely is becoming more open in terms of the debates and discussions. At least that's, that's what I notice in my context, so. Mm -hmm. um, there is one question from the audience, I think referring to what you've just said regarding manipulation manipulation what about the image uh, propagated by the soviet union in lithuania after the war does this have any an impact on the literature on the situation in lithuania because we already know that during Soviet times, um, people dealt with collaboration or with the Nazi occupation, etc. But nevertheless, it has been used for propaganda. And the later propaganda, one can say it was kind of a, a counter propaganda. So how do you yeah. how do you get out of it? How do you leave this frame? Very simple. We depropagandize history. We rely on research, on open, honest thorough research, national and transnational. Simple. Um, it's not, 
good to instrumentalize history, to turn into propaganda. That's precisely what Soviets did when we look at this, you know, documentaries, let's say, from the Soviet period. For example, about the second wave of the perpetrator trials was very interesting documentaries where fragments of the actual perpetrator trials um, were, were kind of filmed and, and and used selectively, but it's always in these large meta narratives with some facts kind of real, but somewhat displaced, some facts made up, and large, large monumental narrative. This is not a good practice of history. This is propaganda. Who wants to re remain in this kind of propaganda frame? Therefore, as my colleague already said before, an honest, uh, thorough, professional, open-minded research, and then education. I do believe, believe in it very, very kind of wholeheartedly. That's, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wie kann man das machen? Frau How is this possible? Mrs. Tomsona, you are doing it. For example, at your memorial, it is one of your tasks to convey history. How do you do that? How do you try to do that? We are open to place for discussions, and it means that also Vanna Gaeta has been here. It almost broke our museum. It's not <laughs> such a huge place. Everyone came for Vanna Gaeta discussion here. Hardcore pro, I don't know, Soviet um, people who are like, you know, Latvians are kind of half fascists. Uh, we have a national group we have people who are just like interested and oh it's a wonderful story we have to hear about Vanna Gaida's book we had every every possible uh, strain and and you know type of uh, of uh, people here it was the uh, discussion was in Russian that's also you know it's interesting and that's the only time in a museum I felt I felt like I'm an in circus dealing with tigers because everyone wanted to speak at the same time <laughs> so but uh, when people said but how we can give a platform to someone that says sometimes very outrageous things because she's a journalist she's not a historian and also sometimes her statements are the blanket statements so we had a, three historians one of them jewish historian who I uh, try to answer and explain how the situation in Latvia and Lithuania is different, uh, why it's not correct uh, sometimes to kind of to unify and generalize the things in conversation about collaboration and about uh, that we do talk about the collaboration of uh, with Nazi regime in Latvia and uh, and our mistake is probably the same, but we just think that those were like a thousand people who were in Arai's commando. And so where do we stand on bystanders, those who kind of helped participate as like, what, what, so where we are. And so those are for grown-ups and we have uh, movies and discussions and conversation here in Latvian and in Russian and in English if people come from abroad. So that also diversifies public that comes, also schools. We have Russian schools and Latvian schools that come uh, to the, our pedagogical programs. And what's important, we collaborate with Jewish community because it would be unfair that we the museum is dedicated to the Jewish rescue in Latvia and not in a slightest we are not trying to whitewash the story kind of to shine the light only on the Jewish rescuers you know we had about more than 400 but there's a big research done now and and kind of to leave the collaboration and why these Jews had to be rescued you know what happened here uh, so those stories we uh, we try to tell through the children's books. We collaborate with children's writers that tell the story. We collaborate with filmmakers, and the film got awarded. It's called The Mover about Janis Lipke, and it had a first big scene ever in Latin mm -hmm. cinema of Rumbula. Mm -hmm. Rumbula is the biggest 
massacre of uh, Jewish population here in, in Latvia. So those are like, we try to mix uh, mix media and just to uh, give Du und verstehe ich sie to, richtig, weil das würde hier sehr gut an eine. Do Publikum I get you right? Because that was also um, very much fit a, a question from the audience that you try to uh, reach out to the younger audience. This is a question that was asked. Do you also reach out to the younger audience? And how is their attitude towards national socialism and the Soviet time? Uh, in at Latvian schools, they study. Um, Uh, Nazi occupation, for example, Soviet occupation, they study long time, but in Nazi occupation and the Holocaust, they study twice and ninth grade and the 12th grade. So whenever we get a school kids who are in between those, we have to start from zero pretty much. Who are the Jews? Like what mm -hmm. was the Soviet occupation, Nazi occupation? What it means the rescue, why someone had to be rescued. And what we are helped with is writers, the children's writers that write also books. So it's much easier to listen to the, the visuals, also kind of uh, postcards and, and all kinds of uh, uh, orientation games and all kinds of, you know, involvement that the young people can kind of do the research also themselves. And the discussions after films where you are allowed to ask stupid questions. And even when we had a president of Latvia who came to the museum, we had a Russian school here for the pedagogical programs. So when we were like, here, ask the questions also to the president about the you know, Second World War or like have a conversation. That was that's something very healthy, I think. And it it doesn't solve the problem that the commemoration will be very different, you know. Uh, in Russian families in Latvia and sometimes Latvian families uh, but uh, just to show the world is um, is uh, is complicated we are not trying to simplify it and the great Lithuanian example how to tell these stories about the Soviet occupation and deportations for children they just published the book that's called Siberian Haiku mm -hmm by uh, Jurga Ville, and it's translated in English and in Latvian now. And we don't have that book about deportations that is very human, very warm, very tough, full of humor. You know, it's none of, none of it that I would read that it's only, you have to just cry your eyes out. And so I think, uh, so I'm jealous of Lithuanians that they found <laughs> this angle, how to do this. Uh, it's like a comics book, but an art book, like a novel in, in pictures. Uh, and it's very, very powerful. And you really get the idea of the horror of the deportation, but also this resilience, how you survive there. And Sie betonen immer wieder sehr stark eben auch die very much highlight the meaning of culture and of uh, conveying a history with the help of culture, with the help of books, of arts, films to younger generation. We do also at the Freedom Monument for the 30th of November, we organize just for Riga. Uh, also commemoration of the Jews who were killed in Rumbula massacre, but that's at the Freedom Monument, just to give this notion also to very young, a lot of young people come and lay candles, that they were part of Latvia, they were Latvian Jews, they were part of our society, with your great grandfather or grandmother, they went to same schools, did the same doctors, just to have this notion that it's not like something that can be compared com Hurt lies, whatever the word. Is. Just you put in a different box that this is where Jews are dealing with this story. You know, we are dealing with the Soviet occupation, mm -hmm. and 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 then we are left with um, people from psychiatric wards yeah. who were killed also, Nazi so times. So you, uh, so you try to get away from a national or ethnic approach. I've got another yeah, question from the audience. It's a question to Melis Maripu. The question how the younger generation in Estonia deals with the legacy of the two dictatorships. Are the pasts a topic in the families? 
And we've just heard that in Latvia, there are different stories being told in Estonian uh, or in Latvian and Russian families. How is this in, in Estonia, Mr. Maripu? I would say that the general situation in Estonia is quite similar to Latvia. Um, the situation in Latvia and Estonia during the German occupation and the Soviet occupation were not the same, but um, the differences uh, were small. And the situation in Latvia, when we think of uh, the Russian-speaking part of the population, it's uh, quite uh, similar to uh, the uh, Estonian population. The younger generation of today uh, maybe is not that much interested in historical questions as we were, as it was maybe 20 or 15 years ago. When I remember the beginning of the restoration of our independence in the 90s, at that time, younger people were very much interested. They tried to read everything that was published. They they talked about very serious topics with their families. At Soviet times, people did not speak much about um, former events, um, not in families, in some, but uh, I think not in many. After the political change, when people felt more free, they started to um, tell stories to their grandchildren. And there was a natural, it was a natural part of everyday life to talk about history. However, today, when I try to understand what young people are doing in their free time, then history is um, lagging behind, is in the background. When our colleagues uh, prepare events for school children, then of course, uh, the young people are interested in what we are doing with, and they um, visit our events uh, with a lot of interest. They want to participate in our programs, uh, just as uh, what is going on in Latvia and what is, uh, what Mrs. Thompson told us. You mentioned programs for school children. That's also an interesting question, I think. How is it possible to convey your knowledge that you as a historian have? Um, you uh, said you want to be as objective as possible and you collect objective facts. How do you convey them to the, to the society? That's a difficult question because uh, sometimes I have the feeling that the work of a historian happens um, separately uh, and detached from society and most people are not interested in what we are doing um, in the newspapers and on TV um, history is presented by journalists and historians can write whatever they want but uh, it does not enter this debate this public debate um, when it comes to this uh, we are very pessimistic but nevertheless, we try to reach young people with simple words, with the help of personal stories, with family stories. These are means of approaching young people and of uh, getting them into contact with history. You already talked about school programs you offer. There's also a museum that is being set up at the moment. Are this ways um, how you try to convey your knowledge to society? Which other formats do you use? Do you, for example, cooperate with memorials? Mm, this is uh, one of the ways we are trying to use. Our museum is open now. Um, 
as a temporary museum or a kind of pop-up museum. We used um, the place of central commemoration in, in Tallinn for several years, uh, but um, it is in a very bad state. It is being renovated and we hope that uh, we will be able to open a new museum in 2026. Next summer, the temporary building will remain open, but at the moment, our main problem is uh, that there's a huge building that doesn't have any heating. And it opens only from May to September. And this means uh, that for school children, um, most of this time is holidays. And we can't offer anything to school children during this time, so we can't work actively with them. So we are very much looking forward to the time when our new building or, or our renovated building will open and when we will be able to use it all of the year. So talking about imparting knowledge and history today now there is another question coming from the audience audience bringing us back to um the year 1989 asking the following what about the events so how the injustice committed during soviet time um how was this influence and how did it influence um, dealing with? And I would like to ask um, this question to you, Mr. Davolute. So in um, Lithuania and Latvia, the independence movement in the fight against um, Soviet tanks and armies, but in Estonia, it was quite peaceful and not bloody at all and not violent at all. Does this have any impact or consequences for how you deal with this past? Did it influence how you deal with um, the Soviet past? You mean this particular, um, this particular loss, the particular resistance to the, to the Soviet um, forces, to the Soviet tanks and so on, that particular event? Yeah. Uh, well, it is certainly part of this, Yes, this is what I, how I interpret okay. the question coming from the audience. Um, so, because it was more violent in Latvia and Lithuania, right. it was more difficult um, compared to the situation in Estonia. Right. Um, I think uh, these events are certainly part of the kind of post-Soviet uh, collective Lithuanian identity. It's certainly part of the memory culture it's one of the widely celebrated public events but I have to point out um, if I understood the question correctly how the events how the anti-Soviet uh, discourse or the events that took place at the time the rallies the uncovering of Stalinist repressions the deportations and so forth influenced the post-Soviet Lithuanian collective identity that's how I understood it so I would say profoundly because that is precisely when the foundations of the new interpretation of history were laid and for a long time were dominant. Uh, it was very much focused um, on the Soviet repressions, on the suffering of the, of the Lithuanians, and then also this led to the foundation, founding of some very important institutions. For example, the uh, genocide and resistance research center you know it was very much based on the initiative to collect the stories the documents the testimonies of all sorts from people who suffered from soviet um, repressions and then this really laid the foundation of these particular institutions and solidified this narrative of what scholars call the narrative of si fighting and suffering only later on, different segments of um, the interpretation of the past were, you know, questioned, reflected, and the issue of the Holocaust was brought forth, and so forth. That started once again with the with founding of the International Commission, with other transitional justice uh, measures of transitional justice, with, uh, uh, with more scholarship, also including the international partners, and so forth. So to answer it short, 
definitely influenced it profoundly. But now we have the task to combine this kind of national, sometimes ethnocentric perspective with a broader, broader vision of what was happening at the time and the experience of other ethnic groups, um, you know, the Jewish population, Sinti and Roma and so on and so forth. In other words, to see beyond ourselves and the suffering of our ethnic group. So. About the barricades, um, I do remember that uh, I'm that old in 1991, when we all went, I'm from Riga, we went to the barricades in the old city and helped to distribute tea or, you know, and for us, it was an uh, adventure. Only parents and grandparents understood the uh, gravity of the situation that you really can be run over by tanks uh, or something like that. For us, it was uh, something exciting happening. And also this patriotic idea that just because we children are going to be there, the tanks are not run over us. Like this wonderful and stupid idea. Uh, so big was my surprise when I, after living in Israel for many years, I returned to Riga to discover that barricades are celebrated uh, in pretend barricade fire fires, you know, uh, at the kindergarten and schools. So something that you witness as a, a participant, it has become this commemoration already for the children, how to tell the story, how we Latvians protected our independence you know, against these uh, the Soviet uh, forces. And uh, this year, it's 30 years since the barricades. And uh, so the commemoration of all the six victims who were killed uh, here in the in a old city of uh, Riga, uh, city center, uh, it was very meaningful. There was a movie made, there was concerts. Okay, it's pandemic, so it was kind of uh, all distance and you know whatever but there was the music and people kind of told their their barricade stories and and what happened so it's very surprising for me that it lasted uh, the event themselves like for two weeks but uh, my mom had to work to go to work to them where the parliament building is Saima uh, mm -hmm. she had to they all also all her colleagues had to go down and up from the trucks you know there was these big trucks to protect uh, the parliament building so they this is how she went to work and she said for first weeks it was weird and then we just got used to it so i think for the children of nowadays kind of who live in kind of protected society it's uh, it's very close to their parents' generation, so it's much more maybe easier to convey that part of the story and the resistance to the Soviet regime, even though it's kind of sometimes naive and idealized, and you know, uh, but it gives this uh, kind of you're not the victim there; you are kind of the hero finally. Mm -hmm. um, here eine there is another question coming from the audience and I will ask this question because I think it's a question for both of you and I would like to come back to what you've just said so does this does it mean that there aren't different ethnics or ethnicities or ethnic or ethnic groups um, remembering this. What about the Russian group, the, the Russian ethnic group? Um, what about them? Do they talk about um, the, the past? And I think it's especially um, interesting for Estonia with a huge um, Russian min minority. But Ms. Thompsona, I would um, start with you, then to you, Ms. Um, Davaluta, and then to you, Mr. Maripu. So what do you think? What about the other ethnic groups? Do they participate? Do they share this um, memory, so to speak? Uh, in Russian schools, they are under kind of similar program, you know, they all study at school, uh, barricades and, and their story. But I think it was pretty recently was uh, research done about the knowledge of history of Second World War. And the Russian school had better knowledge 
and maybe it comes from the fact that there is this um, history that you study at school and then there's a private history of their maybe grandparents or or something that is maybe uh, they have different angles to the to the story uh, so that would be interesting about the barricades. But the concrete, the Ereignisse 91, I hope that's But I think this question referred to what happened in 1991, rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would be uh, complicated at which side of barricades you were, because there were Russians in Latvian National Front. Mm -hmm. There were Russians, and there were plenty of Russians also there. And there were Russians, of course, who supported communist regime. But it's imagine it's like another generation or some, in some cases, almost two generations. So it very much depends on where the new generation stands. They feel some of them feel like Europeans. They love to travel. They love to enjoy hipster culture. And now because we have all this, what we called Putin refugees, meaning uh, very like well-to-do people, intelligent people from Russia who just live here. So there is some mingling and cultures developing in different way that uh, I wouldn't predict it necessarily. So I think it would be very different. And if you look at the generations, like how they reacted, many Russians felt like down, of course, you know, especially those who experienced unemployment and, and they have, were forced enforced you know they, they had to learn latvian and 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 not to be the part of the kind of the main national narrative here um so i think it's it, and if you talk about young people then um, it's different i go to russian stand-up and it's one of the places where you can really they can laugh about the these things about the language and the cultural differences and they are, that they are not really mm -hmm. Russians in Russia. They're not like, they're like, oh, you exotic, great people. And here they're like Russian, although they speak fluent Latvian. So it's sometimes it's great to immerse yourself in this different environment to understand that, yeah, it's not necessarily that everyone had to be absolutely thrilled about the, our version of independent Latvia. But it still doesn't cancel that these many young people feel part of part of part of this country. So, Ms. Davoluta, what do you think? How's the situation oh, in Lithuania? It is a very good and a very, very complex question. And actually, I do not think we know very well how the memory in these families work and what these people you know, think and feel. At least I do not know um, as far as my research is concerned. So this would be pure, pure speculation. I would agree that um, because of the generational change, um, parents, you know, the, the, the experiences and the memories of the parents or grandparents would differ from the younger generation of what was called the hipster generation and so forth, whatever we call it. So um, it's, it's a complex question, but I would, I would like to uh, say that I think there is still research lacking um, uh, on this issue. And it reminded me, I just recently, I'd say a week ago, I read an interesting article by actually a German scholar, Felix Kravacek, um, about uh, a comparative mm -hmm. study about um, how German youth and, sorry, not uh, German youth, Belarus, Belarusian youth and Latvian youth uh, see the, you know, uh, the attitude towards history, especially the issue of collaboration and the argument in this article that, um, for example, the Latvian youth sees history, history in much more kind of um, less reflective way and brush aside this issue of collaboration or responsibility and so forth. And the Belarusian youth engages with it much more in kind of, you know, more profound ways. This is a bit simplified, the description of this article, but this research I found extremely interesting. I do not think that we know very well about this generational change and the, about the attitude of the different generations regarding the memory of that particular point that you mentioned. So sorry, I can't elaborate on that more. Mm -hmm. So. 
<laughs> yeah, also die Unterschiede. So the difference is not only in terms of um, ethnicity or ethnic groups, but also when it comes to generations. So what Absolutely. about the situation in Estonia? Is, um, is it a comparable situation? Weiß ich, das bin bestimmt nicht. Uh, aber nach meinem eigenen persönlichen Gefühl würde ich auch sagen, dass Leute aus ganz junger Generation, schon 20 Jahre alt, oder, sie sind oft auch sehr integriert mit der technischen Gesellschaft und sie können solche... That they are integrated and that they know that the younger generations know um, what, that they think about what happened in the past and that there are nevertheless differences, but this is only my personal opinion. So I think my generation, for example, um, they have their opinion and then the younger generations, they have their point of view, but I don't know whether I really know... Um, What they do, I can't really um, tell you what they think. But nobody knows about these kind of those kind of statistics. So I think it's quite difficult to say what people think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's desirable to do research on that, isn't it? There's another question from the audience to you, Mr. Maripu, a question on the topic of uh, rivalry. Is there also a rivalry between regional, national ways of remembrance and um, pan-European or Western European narratives? Yeah, or nein. Yes and no. When we think that The Western European narrative means that Holocaust is a, a central event and um, a, a sin and the, that uh, this historical um, event is uh, very dominant, then yes. Um, The Estonian-speaking uh, people in Estonia do not 100% share this view. They feel that particularly um, the, the other dictatorship in Estonia, which lasted uh, for 50 years and um, repressed tens of thousands of people, then um, this is uh, a history that is much closer to the people than the Holocaust. Of course, nobody would say that um, Holocaust, the Holocaust is um, not a crime that um, is um, known all over the world and that everybody has to know about it and that it has to be taught at schools. But within um, the Estonian community, within a community uh, where we have our own history, not many people understand that the focus of this transnational history has to be on something else. People are much more interested in their own history, in our own history. They think it's more important. And they think, why do we have to know about uh, other things such as Holocaust when we can also deal with our own history and learn uh, about uh, what things looked like in the other dictatorship, which is much, much closer to us? Mrs. Tom Sona, you um, instantly raised your hand. Do you know similar debates from Latvia? I wanted to mention debate when uh, uh, we participated in a Zoom, as everything happens now, was uh, Russian youth. Uh, discussion was in Latvia. They feel part of Latvia. And what was interesting, that divide is not necessarily... Uh, we have a lot of research in Latvia about how the attitudes changed towards the independence and Second World War commemoration. There's a big sociological and published research that's been done recently. But what I wanted to say about those young people is 
uh, the questions that really pissed them off were like, do you feel more like Latvian or Russian? And all these things, they were really getting angry. And, and talking about not only history, but how they perceive themselves. What was interesting is sometimes there's a divide. It's the same as the Latvian, the same as in Europe. Are you progressive? Are you more conservative in your views? Do you support the LGBT community? How much your family is made of Russians, Polish, Jews, and Latvians, and not only, maybe only just Latvian, uh, uh, Russian families. So I think that uh, that's why, as Violetta said, it's a complicated issue just because these people are made of different identities, but you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Maripu just mentioned that many Estonians do not perceive the Holocaust as part of their uh, national Estonian history. Uh, how is the situation in Latvia? Uh, I think that was a part of the issue. But I think the last 10 years have been uh, changing radically this notion, uh, not only because of documentaries made, Uh, about Latvian Jews, and also not Latvian Jews only in Riga, but in Kurland, like in western part of Latvia. Uh, also about who are the famous Jewish uh, Latvian musicians, uh, politicians, the men who wrote the constitution of Latvia, like all kinds of people, they are highlighted. And one of the heroes of uh, revival of the fight against Soviets was a Jewish man, Mavrik Wolfson. So I think it's more this understanding of we do have to deal with it and it's kind of part of the history. What always happens after all these documentaries are shown on television or films, the television always gets complaint letters. How did they dare to say that Latvians participated? Especially if it's in the small cities. We had about a city of, uh, of uh, uh, in, uh, Sasmaka, uh, Valdemarville, uh, especially because it's a small city. So people recognize surnames. And there was a horrible story of the locals participating on the killing and torturing local Jews. And, and so there is this, of course, it's very difficult to perceive that your village or your city uh, and your neighbors of your grandparents' generation have participated in the rape and the humiliation of those uh, local Jews. So that is always, there are both sides. There's something that is uh, like these popular products that are made there, you see, how locals participated and, and, and very understandable reaction, the people just don't accept it they try to find it in which way it's a fake story <laughs> so but it's it but it's, it's a discussion so that's kind of uh, I think that's just a healthy society they should should discuss it and there are people who will always tell no Jews are communists so mm. we don't care so it's but it's a small percentage of people mm. mm -hmm. Frau Davolute yeah Mrs. Davolute <laughs> Well, um, I think this is a huge problem, uh, first of all, in terms of knowledge, to see Holocaust as something external to our national history. It's also factually absolutely incorrect. Um, now, in the Lithuanian case, well, everybody knows we lost basically the entire Jewish community, almost 200,000 people. But the important aspect is that most of these people, absolute majority of these people were murdered right there in small towns and villages. And there were you know, in small locations, and they were integrated in the society. These were actually, well, um, you know, to use St. Thomas Grosch, uh, the title um, of his book, Neighbors, but not only Neighbors, it were, I mean, it was part of the same social texture for centuries. And this was all happening right there. So to see these events as something external is just absolutely the impoverishment of history, of our history, then we just kind of cut part of the history, throw it out and focus on another half of 
part of history. So I cannot possibly understand this ours and not ours. This is definitely ours. Sometimes, unfortunately, it is seen as some external meta narrative with a big capital letter imposed on us. But that's precisely the lack of education. And the last final point, I don't want to take the space, is that these testimonies of the locals, they exist. And the memory exists. It, it, that memory simply has not been efficiently integrated into the into the you know, into education and the, and the large narratives that, that are then kind of circulating around in society. They existed. The, the, the witnesses did not have any problem telling about what they've seen or they had experienced. And a lot of them actually, you know, had empathy. Collaborators is a different story. But I, feel, I, I believe that, especially in the provinces, a lot of this regional memory it has not been kind of dug up and integrated and made into our own national history. You know, it's just part of our topography and part of our history and we have to deal with it. And I believe we are strong enough to do so. Yeah. May I add something? <laughs> Please. I would like to explain why the Holocaust and the fate of the Jewish community in Estonia does maybe not play such a big role or does not seem to be our history in Estonia. The Jewish community uh, was very different in the three countries. The Estonian Jewish community was very small. We had only about 0.4% of Jews in among our population. And they did not identify with the Estonian speaking community. The Jews in Estonia spoke uh, Russian or German, and they were not very closely connected uh, with Estonians. They did not live in villages or small towns, but more in Tallinn and Tartu the biggest towns uh, in Estonia. They were businessmen, they were uh, not farmers. And that is why Estonians did not, did not really get to know much about the Jews in Estonia and about what was happening in Estonia. Mm -hmm. However, it is a fact that these Jews were murdered, that hardly anyone survived. Um, Estonia was declared free of Jews very early and many Jews were deported later as well. Uh, so this is part of the legacy, just as Mrs. W. said. It's a legacy that uh, Estonians have to deal with and have to talk about. Yes, you're right. But I just wanted to explain why um, people did not perceive, does, do not perceive this as part of their own history. This is an important part of the general history of Estonia, but not of the personal history of the people. It's Estonian history, yes, but still not personal history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe many people just don't perceive it as an Estonian history, although it belongs to the Estonian history. I think this is just part of the challenges Mrs. Thompson was speaking about, too these minutes of uh, remembrance of uh, the Rumbola massacre in the center of Riga, you do it in order to explain that this is part of our history. Um, it's not uh, just part of the history of one ethnicity. And uh, yes. as you say it, Mr. Maripo, um, <laughs> Yeah, this is changing. We're now at the most interesting part of our discussion, and we've also reached the end of our discussion. This means that I um, have to say goodbye to you, but um, 
I would like to um, ask you and also our audience to continue the debate, to become active, just as you three are already. You um, showed in a very impressive way how ambivalent uh, remembrance can be and uh, what kind of confrontations with one's own guilt can take place and what kinds of interesting processes are taking place in your countries. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank all who asked their questions in the chat. I'm very sorry that I was not able to read out all questions. There were just too many, but I was very glad that you participated. I would like uh, to invite you to our next discussion, which will take place on the 22nd of June, the day of the German uh, attack on the Soviet Union. This will be our next discussion in our series on transitional justice. We uh, will talk about the Balkans. Our title is Hate or Reconciliation, National Identity and Transnational Relations in the Balkans. Thank you very much for uh, participating um, and have a great evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Goodbye.